started off today with a couple of, of segments of the BSSW tutorial, and um, and then we heard from uh, Joe uh, Schoonover uh, from Fluid Numerics on uh, on the, the topic of continuous benchmarking in the cloud, and, and just now from Samir on, on E4S, and, and all of these are kind of related as, as awesome tools that, that you can think about um, digging in and, and improving software quality and, and using those as, as ways to kind of make your development um, process more fun and easy. Um, the things that I'm going to talk about today are specifically refactoring scientific software followed by reproducibility. They're the things that, that all of us in, in this conference um, kind of take near to heart. Um, the things that I'm sharing are slides that, that you can find on our website. And, and if you um, get inspired by these and want to take them back to your project teams, I encourage you to, to grab those slides and, and do a similar presentation to get people that you're working with on board. Here's our, our preferred citation for the slides. Um, for refactoring, we'll, we'll jump in. What is refactoring? Um, it's, a, it's a discipline technique for restructuring how your code works without actually changing the external behavior of your code. So think about a code that's it's already working and it's doing what it mo what it's supposed to do. Um, however, you want to uh, do a little bit of restructuring and tweaking inside of that code. <clears throat> of course, in order to do that, there's a whole bunch of steps that you have to go through. And this tutorial is going to give you some you know, language and, and ways to explain what it is you're doing and, and how and why. Um, it's also really important to start with a baseline uh, because you have a working code you have the ability to create that baseline for comparison as you move forward with your process why would you want to do all of this work if it if it's as i say it is hard work well um you want your code to be modular and and you want to be able to to work with it and show it to others and explain easily what it does and, and a more modular you know more well-defined um, um and, and kind of better structured code is great for that. It's also important if you're adding new functionality or porting to new platforms to really take a, a good look at how your code is structured and make sure that it's, um, it's ready to expand. I know that when I develop things, I generally start with a single file and then I restructure it and I add more and then I restructure it and I add builds and then I restructure it. And every time I expand it, there's a restructuring phase. Um, so I'm going to walk you in this presentation through a couple of workflows, through, through this workflow a couple of times, uh, some different projects. And I think we kind of are familiar with this as developers. There's, you know, starting with your, your existing code and, it, you know, having a good starting point, uh, doing a little bit of development and then using a regression test. So the testing phase is really going to be important when you're refactoring, having good tests and, and knowing where your code is at. Uh, doing something incremental enough that's that's small enough that usually you don't have to do too many cycles through the, the fix um, before that one piece of your refactor gets done. Um, of course, once that one piece is done, you're not necessarily done with your entire refactor. Um, if you have a large refactoring to do, there might be multiple passes through this loop. Um, but when you're pretty sure that you're done, you still have to think about um, doing some integration tests and adding on top of you know what you've refactored now, take it out to the world and, and you know look at your your customers and your, your downstream people who are using your code and and make sure that that their work is integrating with what you've done and everything is uh, is connected pretty well. And of course, you can celebrate when all of that's done. Uh, we have a running example that we're using for um, walking through our BSSW tutorials. It's it's a simple one dimensional. Um, diffusion or one dimensional heat uh, diffusion equation and it's simulated in a, in a time dependent manner. Um, and you can imagine uh, a refactoring exercise where you have one big monolithic uh, file that has all the functionality just thrown into into one single source code file. A lot of us have, have seen projects like this or um, you know if you're building a new software this is how they start out. And what you really want to do is kind of build a modular version where you have individual uh, pieces of functionality kind of isolated from each other as, as much as you can or as much as is feasible. Um, in order to get into that refactor, um, rather than just diving in and, and digging in and starting to do things, um, it's important to think about what's your starting place and where do you want to be. So in a, a simple, um, in, our, in our simple example, the starting place is that we have a code that's doing what it's supposed to be doing, but it's not structured perfectly. Um, and what we want to do is our definition of done will be that the, the code is, um, the refactor is complete when it's no longer monolithic. We have reusable smaller pieces. Um, and 
and it's a little bit easier to see how to, to test um, our code. So let's see, in order to, now that we understand what our, our code is gonna look like once it's refactored, um, we'll have modular pieces split out uh, with a cleaner and more maintainable code. We're gonna think through some steps to get there. Um, and these are the actual steps that we'll divide as our, as our one cycle through um, the refactoring process. Um, and, and for this one, it's gonna be separate out the utilities. Those are gonna be the easiest part to, to isolate because they're not con super connected to all the code. Um, then we'll we'll start on the, the the difficult parts, which are putting the global definitions into a header file, kind of starting to um, to break off into to a header and library like structure. Um, and then we'll have to do a little bit of work with the the build chain to to make sure that the the build process is working. Of course, it's important um, to really think carefully if you're proposing to do uh, new code or intrusive changes. Usually, you don't want to do those as part of the refactor because the refactor should should change your code around so that it's still working, um, but it's structured so that you can add on to it later. Um, now, cost estimates. Um, if, you're, if you're planning your refactoring this way and you've, you've talked to your project team and you know exactly what you wanna do, you're in a great place because you can start to think about cost estimates. And, and um, these cost estimates are things like, um, how much is it gonna? How much time is it gonna take to actually change pieces of the code around? But also, how much time is it gonna take to run the tests and to fix um, unexpected glitches, which can be hard to anticipate? And also, how should we do um, integration tests? And are we gonna have to add more documentation? And, and all of that should go into your 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 estimated timeline and cost for doing the refactoring exercise. Um, you also want to know how much change you can expect in your in your behavior of your code because sometimes refactors don't come out with you know, bitwise identical reproducible results from your original version of the code. Um, you might end up in your refactor with, with a better version of the code, but, but you also have to have a way to compare it to your old version. All right, so incorporating testing overheads is, is one of those hidden costs that sometimes you don't think about. You think, well, I'll just go and change things around and it'll work, but um, making the tests stay in, in sync with the code is really important so that you know where you're at and that you can make it an incremental process. Um, and so it's important to put those in. You might want to just go ahead and add 50% to whatever cost you estimate, just because you will run into unexpected glitches with your tests. All right, so rather than, um, rather than refactoring a monolithic code and taking you through those steps, I'm actually just going to give you a really simple smaller example because if I do that, then, then I can get through it in, in a shorter talk. Um, in this smaller example, what I'm gonna do is look at two different time integration schemes, the, the finite time difference scheme and an upwind integration scheme that's um, it's, it's upwind, right? So you're looking on, on one side specifically so that you get a, a better numerical behavior for certain kinds of problems. Um, and what I wanna do is do a refactor where an original code, which has two different functions that, that do a time step with FTCS or a time step with upwind, can be written as if they're, they're the same function with alternative options in the code. Um, and so that's kind of interface work so that the interface to the time integrator will, will behave similarly um, as it's seen from the main code. Here's where we get to do a little bit of work on the baselines. Um, before starting the refactor, you've got a working code. So go ahead and run, uh, you know, take stock of what tests are there, um, run your tests. And here's, some, um, here's a picture of what happens if you run with code coverage. If you're, if you're using GCC, it's got a, a dash coverage flag that's built into it. And when you compile with a coverage flag, you'll get some, uh, some cryptic GCOV output files. And, and when you link with it and you run the code, it will actually output these you know, files on the side, which tell you um, which tell you in, in text mode, um, what is your, what lines of the code were exercised and, and what's your code coverage of, of the runs that you just performed. And so if you're running tests, then you should be able to get this coverage report after you've compiled this way. <clears throat> in this case, what we're seeing are lines with these, um, with these pound signs that are telling us some of the lines of the code weren't exercised during our testing phase. So that's probably the first thing we need to fix before we start refactoring. And in order to enable those, um, in this code specifically, uh, you just have to run the code and give it the option say, to, to tell it, um, I want to use the upwind algorithm so that I've tested both of the two um, algorithms that I want to work on in my refactor. Okay, so you've done that. We now have baselines for both of them. 
we're ready to start um, fiddling with the code. We've talked um, a, a lot already, and, and we've seen uh, people in, in this um, in this conference tell us about the Git workflows. So get your Git workflow ready to, to do um, some work on a branch. Um, look at the starting code, and, and in our example, we've got function calls to do a time step on uh, FDCS or upwind integrators that are slightly different in the way that they're called. There's also a Crank Nicholson, uh, which is a, a third integration scheme. Um, and so in order to have a code that's going to be able to call all three of these, you want to think, you know, what's my interface going to look like after my refactor? And how do I turn these interfaces into something that's identical? Your, pro your programming team may want to use classes or, you know, may use some like high level data structures to pass back and forth. Um, in this case, we're going to do a, a simple thing, which is just give every function call the same arguments. And so there's like an extra, um, there's an extra workspace here for Crank Nicholson that's initialized. So what we'll do is we'll have everything get the extra workspace and everything get initialized. But if we happen to be using FTCS, then we just won't use the initialization or the extra workspace. Um, okay, so to generalize it, we just you know pick out this interface that we're going to make everything use, and then modify the make file to have three separate um, three separate ways to compile, so that the, the main program can either be compiled with one with method one, two, or three. There's other ways to do this, and, and your project team will have its own kind of preferred method. Um, but this is just the general idea of taking us the same interface so that every um, so that your main code doesn't necessarily have to know what it's working with. Um, so you've encapsulated it that way. OK, so now that this refactor is done, the main code um, can now be compiled and run with each one of the, the two different um, inter each one of the two different integrators that we want to test, and we can verify it against the baselines. At this point, you might also think about testing to make sure that your test will fail before you've before you've put everything together, uh, so that you know you're actually testing something the right way. Um, and actually, that's kind of the, the end of this example because we'll assume that you've implemented everything correctly and the interfaces are compiling and working, and you verified against your baselines. Okay, so on to a more complex example. This more complex example comes from um, Anshu Dubey's experience with the refactoring the flash code. Um, and in the flash code, the um, flash code is a is is a um, multi physics code that that deals with uh, stellar phenomenon like exploding stars, and and it's got the um, the same kind of stuff that you'd see in a um, well, okay, the, the same kind of mathematical techniques that you might see in, in a climate simulation where there's a, an adaptive mesh um, with, with, with flowing uh, quantities moving over that mesh. And in this refactor, the purpose of the code was to take, um, to take the adaptive mesh refinement library paramesh and allow AMREX to be used as a swap-in replacement. So this is, again, looking at those interfaces and figuring out um, what do we need to do so that our code can use either one of these two as its provider for, for adaptive meshes? Um, just getting to a diagram like this uh, and you know, that shows the structure of your code, shows what parts of your code are using this library and, and you know, what, we need to, what we need to think about as, as the interfaces between these um, it is not actually a trivial exercise. And so, um, if you're, so if you're considering a refactor, it's really important to start talking with your team about how is the code structured now and how would we like it to be structured after the refactor and to spend time building these sorts of diagrams, which are also great for documentation, by the way, because it's really hard to auto-generate a diagram of, of how the code is used in practice and what's calling what, um, but it's also really valuable. Okay, so in this instance, all that's done for us and we have a nice picture of what we're doing. Let's move forward with uh, the planning phase. This is a picture of the end result of the actual steps that were went through that, that were um, involved in the refactor here. And the initial estimate took about six to twelve. The initial estimate was six to twelve months, but it ended up taking about twelve months um, to get to get all of the um, pieces of this refactor done. And in the cost estimation, important things were, um, you know, how much developer time are you need are you needing to get it done. But also, you know, who are the users of this code, and and can we get buy-in from them? On, are they willing to to um, to wait for this feature, or you know, are they are they willing to uh, deal with the disruption in the way that they're running? Because um, this code is a, a production science code that's impacting people's careers, and it needed to be available. 
Um, so, so anyway, working with your stakeholders and, and understanding kind of the, the context that your code lives in, it's important for designing refactors. All right, there are a couple of ways to get from here to there. Once you've decided we're gonna refactor and here's the, here's the, um, you know, the beginning and the end point, um, it may be the case that you only have to make a whole bunch of small scattered changes. And in that case, um, it might also be okay to make a bunch of independent changes. However, um, in larger cases, you usually run into the, the difficult problem where parts of your parts of your code depend on other parts of your code, and you might want to refactor one or all of those parts. And in that case, uh, you don't want to make a large scale invasive change because what you'll end up with is, is a, a halfway working code that you can't quite explain what is working and what's not and why, and pieces of the code might not work together. Um, it's a great idea to make the changes as small as you can. So what do you do in this case? Well, um, what the Flash team ended up doing is um, two different plans. The first plan was to, um, to turn off all the modules except for the one being refactored and then make a um, kind of have an intermediate way of, of working on each module in isolation or as if it's in isolation so that you can refactor the modules independently. This would work great if, if you know, you're refactoring this module and you don't necessarily have to change too much of its interface with the other modules. Sometimes um, you change both the modules and their interfaces, so this becomes a little bit more difficult to do. Um, so on ramp plan two can show up where you might go one at a time and say, I'm gonna change this module, but put it into a test environment um, where I can kind of change the environment to look like what I eventually want it to look like while I change the module. Um, and then and then we can you know, move this module. We could also, um, okay, so that the, the color of this box is changing because the, the way that the, the refactor was done, and I'll show it in a second here, um, was actually to make this, this module that's changing able to work with both kinds of environments. So it's a little bit more, um, involved. Uh, but in any case, you can imagine doing this for multiple modules, kind of moving them through a test environment where it's easy to change the module and where you know um, kind of how it's interacting as you change it. All right, so how does that work out in practice? Um, requirements gathering. What is, so now, now you've decided you, you have a great idea of how your code's going to be refactored, but you're staring at this, this new library and you're wondering, you know, how do I get my existing library to look like the new library? Or how do I get my code to work with the new library with completely different functionality? Um, so requirements gathering actually became, um, became something that took a significant amount of time, just asking you know, what actually needs to change. And in the case of Amrex versus uh, Paramesh, the big thing that Amrex does differently is that it doesn't have uh, a really well-defined notion of, of boxes that live directly inside of other boxes. So you, you have a coarse grid and a fine grid and the fine grid is, might live inside a coarse grid box. Um, but with AMREX, there doesn't necessarily have to be that relationship. And so uh, the way that AMREX loops through all the grid points is by doing iterators. So in order to, uh, in order to kind of make the flash physics modules work with both kinds of meshes, the team decided, hey, let's just make everything work with iterators because it's the most general strategy and it should work with both kinds. Now that that decision's been made, um, they pulled out just the simplest, smallest hydrodynamics code of, of you know, maybe some advection um, and, and use that as their guinea pig for how do we make it work over these meshes and, and iterators. And so they built a, a nice little iterator interface um, and use that iterator on top of a simple hydro code. Luckily for the team, they had a, an existing arsenal of tests and everything um, was able to be tested as they did this. Um, these iterators, of course, weren't iterating directly over Amrex yet, but they're iterating over the existing mesh provider. So it's, it's kind of just adding some iterators in between the, the hydro code and the, um, the existing mesh. Okay, so now you know, that step's done. Let's work a little bit on AMREX. Uh, AMREX provides some good high-level functions, but they're not the same ones that the code is used to. So the AMREX had to have an extra um, API layer built on it so that, so that the, um, the code could do things like, um, like halo exchanges that it was used to without changing the way that it's actually uh, calling those interfaces. So some extra API was added to the, the provider library um, in order to make the in order to make the use cases 
much simpler to port. So, so far, so good. Now it's time to actually, you know, put the two together and do something real. So the, the simple hydro was switched to something from the code that was turned off a lot of functionality, but was the smallest and simplest unit where they could see an end-to-end -end, uh, run. And of course they could use their existing tests and they brought in this Amrex plus grid API um, or kind of worked on the, the driver so that the grid API looked as much as it could, um, as closely as it could to the existing um, uh, driver API that was used. Um, and finally, um, a little bit more was added to the MREX uh, API and, and more features were turned on. And at that point that they had um, kind of bridged the gap between these two codes and successfully uh, gotten some use cases. And uh, that doesn't mean necessarily that everything is done, but getting that first example down and working was, it was a big success because now they can kind of take that same pathway and widen it out to all the other parts of the code. All right. So um, summary on refactoring. When you're thinking about refactoring, have a really good idea of why you're refactoring, you know, what your target is. If you want to make it more modular, what's going to be more modular? What do the new interfaces look like? And then plan for stepwise um, incremental refactoring tasks that get you there um, and include in those planning costs um, how you're going to work on testing and how you're going to verify it. Um, and it's really important to get buy-in from stakeholders. I also want to note that having those kinds of plans is great to be able to coordinate your team around refactoring work. I have a couple of minutes uh, for questions in refactoring. I don't know if I want to, um, I guess I can stop and answer a question. I don't see any questions in the chat, but uh, welcome to pause a little bit more for people to pose some questions. Okay, well, I'll assume that everybody is browsing through these slides and, and thinking about things that, uh, you know, take home points that they can go and share with their teams. And I'm going to move on now to um, 